the Silk Road to the Kingdom of God. Key words here, silk. So let's take a look at silk. Most of us know what silk is. Silk is that cloth that's been around a long time, very soft, and is dyed in many different colors. You can even make flowers from silk. It's so refined and so tender that <clears throat> I know that, uh, and of course it has the, the reputation coming from China because it comes from a moth, a cycle of a moth. And silk is very valuable because it's very labor intensive. To make silk, you have to culture or take care of the moths. The moths lay their eggs on a mulberry leaf, the, and, the, and the eggs hatch, turn into little larvae, little worms, and they will eat the mulberry leaf, and when they reach a certain size, they will spin a cocoon, and in there is the thread that's spun on the inside to create the silk. Now, the silk has been used uh, by uh, and available to wealthy people for over 2,000 years. <clears throat> so if you if you got a lot of money, and usually royalty, the ones that had a lot of money, could make silk, things out of silk. Whereas the rest of the world wasn't even caught up with making cotton underwear until about 1750. So that's just, what, 200, less than 300 years ago. Uh, and we don't want to talk about what happened before that, but that's the way it was. In fact, I teach, have taught for many years U.S. history classes that all based upon the development of cotton underwear and how all of this struggle was going on through the world, collecting, developing cotton commercially and so forth, and until modern technology made that commercially possible. But silk is labor intensive. It's not quite like cotton. And so the development of this silk means the care for these silk moths. And they start out with the adult worms, lay the eggs, turn into larvae, and then they spin uh, uh, like a little internal web inside of a, a pupa and then eventually hatch out a new moth. So <clears throat> over time, this particular product historically has been very valuable, unavailable in places outside of China or nearby. And so you have this demand for this silk when it was discovered in Europe, hey, we want some of this stuff, really soft. So there's a, uh, I pulled up a map of how to get silk from China historically, what they did. And this was, this path, actually, these trails or paths have been before the time of Christ and developed since that time, where people would be able to make it from the Mediterranean all the way to China uh, and, uh, and places beyond, where they would travel back and forth. Interestingly enough, I will note that one of the points of uh, that the Silk Road from China to Europe would end at the city of Antioch, right on, on the coast of the Mediterranean, north, just north of Israel. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But it wasn't, and so this pathway of these merchants wouldn't just be trading in silk. Uh, now, <clears throat> this, this is, at, if you go from one end to the other, it's about 4,000 miles, okay, beyond the width of the United States. And if you take a look, it wasn't just silk, but ceramics, where we get the term fine china, because they developed porcelain or ceramics. They also traded along this route in, in salt and spices, sugar and tea, but to be able to travel that far, this was before the internal combustion engine. They didn't have planes, trains, and automobiles. And they had, didn't have the sophisticated roads and bridges to cross rivers or mountains. They had to cross mountains. But they couldn't do so for much of the year that were blocked by uh, snow and ice in the winter. Uh, and then in the summer, they also had to cross deserts. In order to cross those deserts, they, uh, uh, they needed to have the equivalent of the truck of the day, which was a camel, and loading up the camels. And, of course, camels can go uh, for uh, uh, several days without water. And the merchants also learned that they had to travel together because 
anybody with a small party would be subject to the highway robberies, the thieves that came along the way. So they traveled together for defense purposes. And China, wanting to protect its trade, built these walls. So the Mongols on horseback couldn't come down and raid the caravans or other places. Uh, we covered that one recently. And so the walls slowed down the highway robbers. They couldn't quite get there uh, uh, quite so quickly uh, and then, and, or escape. And so it really changed the landscape over time on this Silk Road. There were some areas that they had to cross. The shortest way was a bit swampy. Well, what are you going to do there? So they either had to go around it uh, through Central Asia, or they, in some cases, built uh, walkways so they wouldn't sink in uh, uh, through the mud. The, the road uh, was a road to wealth. The merchants would take risks because there was a huge reward. Now, one merchant normally did not go the whole route. They would go part of the way and then trade the goods and pro, uh, to other merchants who would then go part of the way and, and trade. And so there was uh, so a series of trades along the way, and each one of them getting closer to Europe would add value to it, so the product would be more valuable and more expensive as it got toward Europe. But there was a lot of danger on this Silk Road, robbery, you could be killed or injured by, by the thieves. Uh, you might thirst to death. Camels might get by, but a little longer than humans. You might starve to death if you didn't pack enough of the groceries along. Uh, in, in anciently, uh, you, could, you still could get diseases traveling from country to country, but then that's how Black Plague got from uh, Mongolia or China uh, to Europe, was traveling on the roads. And then there's language barriers. We think it's tough trying to understand the people in Oklahoma. Uh, imagine how they had the next country over and so forth and so on uh, had these language barriers. So that's why they traveled short, shorter distances. Now, there was a fellow in the, uh, in the 1200s, famous, and you probably read about him in school. And his name was Marco Polo from Venice in Italy. And he and his father and his uncle at age, the tender age of 21, young man was adventurous, and he thought he would then travel with them and went to China. And he stayed there for about 17 years uh, and worked for the Khan, or the emperor at that time, and became wealthy and converted his wealth to gemstones and made his way back to his home area in Venice, Italy. He then... Uh, Venice uh, 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 and had a war. Italy wasn't one country. It was a whole bunch of city-states. And so he was on the wrong side of one of the local wars, and so he got thrown in jail for a few years. While I was in jail is when he and another fellow wrote a book called The Travels of Marco Polo. Uh, sort of reminds me of Paul getting thrown into jail and started writing. And so we have this evidence of this time uh, that really wowed and amazed uh, uh, Europeans. I mean, bringing things like oranges or citrus fruits back from China and the seeds, bringing them back. Uh, now we just think oranges, Texas, Florida, California, things like that. That wasn't around in Europe or in America for that matter. So there was a lot of things that could bring wealth. Well, I want to draw this analogy today in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9 that the kingdom of God is, symbolizes great wealth. So much so, we have a hard time imagining how wealthy those people are who are in the kingdom of God. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9, but as it is written, the eye has not seen, nor the ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. You see, just as the Europeans could not see China, too far away to see, they could only imagine that what would be like some thousands of miles away, people that were a different race, different language, it was all strictly subject to their imagination. They just really even couldn't imagine it. Uh, and then they had somebody who had actually been there and came back. And so they were really wowed by those stories. But Marco Polo wasn't the only one to make a long journey. This has happened over time, and we have a biblical example 
uh, of another person who made a long journey, uh, and that was a man we know as Abraham. In Genesis 12, starting in verse 1, And the Lord said to Abram, later to be called Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land I will show you. So what about if you woke up some morning and got a message directly from God that says, get yourself out of here and go someplace that you have never been before. Now, remember, there's no planes, trains, or automobiles. There's no internet. There's no telephone. Uh, uh, no cell phones. Uh, no magazines to look at. No encyclopedia, uh, as it were. It says, to a land I will show you. So Abraham did as instructed. And I have a map here. Abraham came, what they call Ur of the Chaldees, which is now in modern-day Iraq, uh, <clears throat> called Babylonia at that time, and went up north to what is now Syria, uh, because to go straight across would be uh, uh, not passable, really passable because of the desert area. And he goes up to a, a city called Haran, and then down into the land of Canaan. So he didn't have a slideshow to show him what he was going toward, what was going to be on the other end of his journey. But he listened to God. Now, to make this trip, just as all of the people had been doing for the previous uh, uh, or, and have been for the last couple thousand years, there was danger in traveling. The danger was also true for Abraham. Could be robbed, could be killed or injured by bandits. He might thirst to death, could starve to death, subject to disease. There would be language barriers along the way. Yet Abraham picked up his family and moved. Now, <clears throat> he didn't do this uh, on a fluke. He was in, uh, instructed to do so. But with that instruction also came a promise to Abraham. In Genesis 12, going on to verses 2 and 3, God said, I will make you a great nation. That's pretty big. Here's a man who had no children, he and his wife, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth should be blessed. It was going to expand out, not just from his family, but around the earth. We can read what Paul wrote to the church in Galatians, in Galatians 3, verse 29. Because Abraham, at the time of the, the promise, didn't have children. But later we read in Galatians 3, 29, if you are Christ's, meaning a follower of Jesus Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, meaning you are one of his spiritual descendants and heirs according to the promise. So this means that the followers of Christ would inherit the promises of Abraham. And that is a valuable promise. We read how valuable in Ma starting in Matthew uh, 13 and verse 34. Jesus was describing what this valuable kingdom was like. In Matthew 13, uh, 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. He recognized the value of this treasure in a field. How many of us have gone out in the field and found something that was remarkably valuable? Well, we've all found something somewhere at some point that we, we recognize the value of. But the implication here is that the man stumbled along this treasure. It's not like he was out looking for it and saying, God, be a treasure out here somewhere. It's uh, that he just came upon it. Well, some of us have come upon the truths of the kingdom of God by accident. Like this man in the field, stumbled across it and then realized this is something valuable. And we seized on the idea. It was when we realized that, then we would make whatever commitment we had to do to get, grasp that treasure. In this case, it was the promise of the kingdom of God in our lives and grasp it, whatever it takes to secure that treasure. We have now, we're in Matthew 13. Let's go to the next verse in 45, verse 13, 45. 
Again, the kingdom of God, a kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold it, sold all that he had and bought it. Now, here's a fellow who is searching for something. So before we have somebody <clears throat> who came across it, stumbled across it and, and recognized the value, here we have a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. <clears throat> and he recognized what he had. He found it and something. Now, I don't know how many of you have, uh, I had an opportunity, and this was many years ago, to go to the Mikimoto Pearl Island in Japan. Uh, really uh, quite interesting, where they make cultured pearls. And I watched, and there's this, take an elevator shaft, and you go down, and there's this cave with a, a window cave, and you can look under the, under the uh, ocean water, and you can watch the young ladies that swim down and cultivate the oysters creating the pearls and you watch you can see them pop out of the boat now they coat their body with some kind of grease so that they have retained the heat within them and then they hold their breath there's no uh, apparatus i'm talking 10 minutes they had to practice i i'm just shocked and you're thinking they're going to be up for air shortly nope 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 Nope. Look at the watch. Nope. And they're down there busy putting the little grain of sand in the oysters to make the pearls. Absolutely remarkable. But in nature, that uh, to find the pearl is really the exception instead of the rule. It's not like Mickey Moto Pearl Island where they were creating the cultured pearls. And this particular merchant recognized something significant of value. Now, when you're culturing pearls, you can culture pink pearls, black pearls, uh, all different kinds and colors, depending upon the type of oyster that they're growing in and so forth. And some are of different sizes, depends on how long they're there. And here's a merchant who knew his business and could grab a hold of what he knew was very valuable. We're going to go now to <clears throat> Acts 9 and verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> there was a person there, a Pharisee named Saul, in Acts 9, verse 1 and 2, who did not recognize the truth. In Acts 9, verse 1, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. I might note, this was right after the death of Stephen, who was stoned to death for preaching the truth. And, and, and the Bible says that Saul was consenting to his death. The implication, he was there. Yeah, this is what he wanted done. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, Saul, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, meaning followers of Jesus Christ, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He wanted to arrest them. Bring him back as prisoners. And what do you suppose would happen to them? Look what happened to Stephen, who was stoned. So he wanted basically an arrest warrant, as it were, so that he could go from Jerusalem off to Damascus. And then we have a, a scenario where Saul, the Pharisee, was blinded on his way by this bright light on the road to Damascus. In Acts, two verses, or Acts 9, verses 3 and 4, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's probably not the best day for him right there or uh, that he would think of at that time. I mean, going along, thinking you're doing the Lord's work. We're going to destroy all of these heretics out there and haul them in, stone them, kill them. And he's struck down by this light. And if fully intending to bring back those people who were preaching and following Jesus Christ. So in Acts 9, let's turn to verse 5. You see, Saul the Pharisee was fighting the truth. In Acts 5, 9, verse 5, and he said, Saul said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Well, the goads, if you hook an ox to a cart 
wants to keep the ox from backing up instead of going forward. Well, they put sharpened sticks in front of the cart or the wagon. So if the ox backs up, it'll back into the sharp sticks and be very unhappy and uncomfortable and decide that they would rather go forward. This keeps the ox from backing up and creating a problem. And there was, and what good would it do for the oxen to go kicking back against the sharp sticks? They would only hurt themselves. And this is the analogy drawn. This is what was happening to Saul. He was kicking against the goads, or as uh, uh, King James says, kicking against the pricks, because it would prick their legs, the oxen or the horse, whatever was pushing back. They would kick against them. It's bad enough to back into them, but then to fight it. Well, Saul was fighting the truth, just as many today are fighting the acceptance of the truth. And when people fight the truths of God, then they suffer the natural consequences of that, just as it would hurt the horse or the oxen to kick back against the goads uh, or the pricks on the cart. So now Saul, here we're in Acts 9, let's turn to verse 6. So Saul the Pharisee cries out for help. He, what do I do? I mean, he's been stricken down. In Acts 9, verse 6, So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Do you suppose that Jesus had Paul's attention? It says right here, What should I do? This is not something he would have said a minute or three earlier. He was stricken. Now, mind you, it was a bright light. <clears throat> and that Paul was utterly shocked by this experience on this road to Damascus. He was stricken. What would you do? Now, if all of a sudden we were struck blind and there was a voice that we couldn't see, couldn't see anything anyway, a voice telling, telling us what to do, uh, we might be inclined to listen. Well, Saul the Pharisee was stricken blind. In, uh, we're in Acts 9, to verse, uh, verse 7. The men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. Verse 9, and he was three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. Well, it appears that uh, his attention was really, really focused. If you don't see and you're not eating or you're not drinking, that's probably a lot of humility being pounded in right about that time. I do want you to notice that Paul wasn't traveling alone. As we've covered earlier, he was traveling uh, with a group of others. First of all, it was dangerous to travel alone. We can look at the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan. He was traveling and got beaten up. Uh, plus, Saul had intended to arrest Christians and Put, bring them back, bound back to Jerusalem. So he had to have men along with him to make those arrests. It's interesting, though, that the men with him didn't have the same blinding experience that Saul had. They took him by the hand. They led him. They could still see. So it's clear the truth wasn't being revealed or pounded into them in the same way. Now, for someone who has a sudden awakening to something, uh, sudden awakening to the truth, we say, well, he had a road to Damascus experience. Well, in other words, his eyes were opened up after he had this uh, experience. This is quite different than Abraham's open and voluntary willingness to follow God's instruction to make a journey to a far land. So in one case, you have Abraham quite willing to follow God and go to a place he didn't know. And all of a sudden, this fellow named Saul, a, uh, uh, an angry Pharisee, uh, was, had his nose rubbed into the truth uh, to meet the very Jesus that he was fighting against. <clears throat> when Abraham was told to go somewhere, there had to be some little fear in it because we read in Genesis 15.1, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram, later known as Abraham, in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. In other words, there's protection. Why would he need protection? Well, we already know there's danger in traveling, robbery, 
being killed or injured by bandits, thirsting to death, starving, uh, possibility of disease or language barriers. And yet, <clears throat> and so protection was pretty important for uh, Abraham to travel. Uh, and then he said a great reward. Well, that great reward said that he would, uh, that his family uh, would, uh, and the blessing would spread to the whole earth. Well, what kind of a reward from that? Because he'll be dead, right? So let's take a look at the value of each human that God has called. In Luke 12 and verse 7, we read how valuable each person is to God. In Luke 12 and verse 7, but the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. We don't really put a big monetary value on sparrows. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, but the thought that the hairs on our head are numbered and that we have significant value to God, that he's recognizing this isn't just the same. We're not just another evolved creature some kind of thriving uh, uh, protoplasm that's strutting around uh, on planet Earth. But there is a great value. We're in Luke uh, 12, verse 7. Let's read on what God has planned for us. In Luke 12, verse 32, a few verses down. Do not fear, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's pretty valuable. We are being adopted, as it were. As a little flock, does it say everyone? It says a little flock, meaning there are some that God is giving to, giving his kingdom to uh, at the time of that writing. And so we have this gift that's coming our way because we have great value. But we read then that the journey, and we know, the journey may be difficult in Luke 12 and verse 4. Luke 12 and verse 4, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, they've no more power that they can do. They can't take away uh, uh, your belief in God. I remember years ago, I had a big decision to make. And, and a friend of mine, a deacon in Minneapolis, and I was saying, you know, I'm really concerned. This was many years ago. And I said, I'm just, I just really, you know, I'm, I'm troubled. If I make this decision and I do this, you know, what's going to happen? And he looked at me and he, a very quotable comment. And he said, they can't take away your birthday. In other words, there are some things they just can't take away. They can't take away your birthday. They can't take away your belief system. Can't take away your belief in the truths of God. And in 2 Timothy 1, 7, we are instructed that even though it's difficult and we may, have be given, we may have fear, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. That should be some assurance and some comfort. We're not doing this trip alone. We're not taking the Silk Road trip alone here because God has given us, he's given us his power and of love and a sound mind. Now, we have to look beyond the fear of the present because everybody has some little bit of fear. That's called reality. Uh, and so if we look in Revelation 2.10, we read, don't fear any of these things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. So there's a reward. There is, <clears throat> uh, there is the, the power, the admonition that there's no reason to fear because it's worth it. The treasure, the pearl of great price is worth the journey. And the Bible gives us an emphasis on this reward. In Matthew 5 and verse 12, this is emphasized, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In other words, anything we do, there's nothing new to this. It's all happened before. 
and look where they were honored. And we just turn to the book of, uh, of uh, or look to Hebrews in chapter 11 and list out the many uh, prophets uh, who went before us and the many people of God who had that strength of faith. Uh, and they were on the same journey that we are. They were on that same journey toward the kingdom of God. But in Hebrews 11, those people just didn't sit in a corner, fold their hands, and say, God will take care of everything all by himself, and I don't have to do anything. Quite the contrary. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, But without faith it's impossible to please him, for he, is a, uh, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So not only do you have a belief, you have a, a recognition that there is a reward at the end of this trail. In James 2, verse 18. In James 2, 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. That's really an instruction for us to take with us. That it's not simply enough to simply believe and say, well, I believe and therefore we don't have to actually do anything. But rather we must take action to show that we are diligently seeking what God has in store for us. So we have, <clears throat> uh, we have the example of the uh, Silk Road to China, where there was a lot of agony and a lot of pressure or a lot of uh, a fear of what could happen on that road. And we have some remarkable uh, stories that have come from the people on that road. They didn't all make it, uh, as it were. And what was their reward was only what was here in this life. But we're not traveling the Silk Road to China. Our reward simply isn't a soft, smooth uh, fabric. And the wealth that's created from trading on that journey, from trading in that fabric, Instead, we journey towards the kingdom of God. And we have to prepare diligently, knowing that we must do our part. And God tells us he will provide us with protection and ultimately grant us the greatest reward, even beyond the imagination of mankind. So we must make the best of our time for our journey to the kingdom of God to be the most productive. So when we look at this uh, when we read the Bible, let's recognize it's not just the Silk Road to China. It's the Silk Road to the kingdom of God and what we will achieve by following what God wants for us is something beyond our little earthly imagination, but the richness of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm.